So let's get the show on the road here. Um, so we do have the next exam coming up, and as I discussed, we're retaking the exam, uh, and we'll be distributed uh, after the problem session next Friday. Okay. So uh, this Friday we'll have. A, a, just a discussion section, I'm posting all the solutions. There's only one more solution to post, prop set nine. Uh, and so, come with questions. All right, and we'll uh, discuss that. If you're not, I will put it on the web immediately after this. So if you're not there at the problem session, you can you can uh, download it. Uh, or email it to you to everybody, probably is what I'll do. Okay? Um, and as I said, we'll discuss a little bit more the rules of the game uh, as time approaches a little bit. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, last time we were talking about an, an important sort of last ingredient of the formal, but maybe there's one more, you might say, sort of postulate of quantum mechanics uh, that we didn't really discuss at the beginning. It's how do you deal with composite systems? And what that means classically, we talk about the notion of a degree of freedom. Okay? So, um, in classical mechanics, to each degree of freedom, we assign a set of a coordinate and a conjugate momentum, right? And if I have uh, multiple degrees of freedom, for example, I have a particle that's moving in two dimensions, or uh, I have two particles moving on a line, those are two examples of systems with two degrees of freedom, okay? And we assign some canonical coordinates to each degree of freedom. I'm calling them generically A and B. And in classical mechanics, what we said is that the joint phase space for the system is given by the formally what we call the Cartesian product, okay? So the, the coordinates on phase space are these, okay? And that's what we call a Cartesian product. Now, as we, I, I mentioned, the division into the degrees of freedom is not unique, necessarily. For example, as I mentioned last time, if I talk about a particle moving in a plane, uh, I could define as my, uh, cannot, I ha could have one degree of freedom be, say, motion along the x-axis and the other one be motion along the y-axis and then there's a conjugate px and py and that's one way to define the degrees of freedom or alternatively I might choose to have xa be the radial uh, let me call it rho the, and the other conjugate, I mean, xb, b phi, right? And then there's a conjugate p phi and p rho. Uh, those, so the division into degrees of freedom is not unique, right? And similarly, a particle, two particles in a line, I can talk about the uh, coordinate of each particle. I can talk about their relative coordinate and their center of mass. Okay, and we'll come back to that, it's gonna be important. Okay, so that's classical physics. In quantum physics, uh, what we said was that if I have different degrees of freedom, what is true is that observables associated with those different degrees of freedom commute. Okay, and that means we can define sort of separate Hilbert spaces for degree of freedom one or A and degree of freedom B with observables that act on each of those Hilbert spaces. And then 
the joint Hilbert space that describes states of the system that describe both degrees of freedom is given by the tensor product, okay? And the tensor product is such that we can define joint states of the system that are product states. And we have this tensor product in between them. And what that, what that physically means, because of course the state, in this case I'm talking about pure states, uh, are uncorrelated. That is to say, if I have a product state, the joint probability distribution for uh, degree of freedom A and B is a probability for A times a probability of B. Right? And that means that there's no correlations between A and B because the, the probability for both things to happen is just the product of one times the product of the other. Does that make sense to everybody? Why? Uncorrelated probabilities are products. But why, if that's true, what is, why is it a product? I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of a tautology. Yeah, so what aspect of probability? I mean, what, what, are we, what are we saying when we say that? The cross terms, when you, when you do the variance, uh -huh. like, you get just the square, but then you also get the cross terms, the covariance, and the zero that is easy. Sure. That's one way of looking at it. Is yeah. this like what we were talking the other day? It's like if I want to look at the probability of flipping two heads, yeah. it's the chance of flipping one head times the chance of flipping the other head? Yeah. No? That's exactly what okay. But so why, when, if you wanted to calculate the joint probability of two heads, why did you just multiply them? Because it seems intuitive to do that, right? Yeah. But that's like, um, so if you're doing tests, you want to use just the normal average. But if right. you're doing something like stocks, if you want to take an average, you use the other kind of average, like the geometric average, geometric. because they depend on each other. Right. Okay. The, way, the way I look at it is the following. If I want, if something is uncorrelated, what it means is the probability of flipping this first coin has nothing to do with what happens to the second coin. So what that, sh what that would mean is that the marginal probability distribution, which is the probability for A to happen, I can write without knowing anything about B. That is to say, if I want to know what the probability, you know, Z, you can have one coin, I'll have one, I flip mine, I can calculate mine independently of yours. And what that says, we know from, a, from probability theory, if I have a joint probability for two things, A and B, then the marginal probability distribution on A is given by the sum of all possible V values, whatever they are. That's the marginal distribution. <coughs> Now, if this is equal to a product state of probabilities, well, then it's obvious. This is just the probability of A. It doesn't depend on B. It's just given by that. So that's the key, a key idea from logic. Two things that are uncorrelated for this and that to happen is just the product of their, their happenings. There, there's no correlation between them. And in quantum mechanics, a state like that we call separable. Okay? And in this case, what it says, the probability of outcomes of observables that act on degree of freedom one, whatever that degree of freedom is, have not, are not in any way correlated with the outcomes. They're independent random variables if the probability distribution is of that form. Let me uh, look at it this way as well, just, just as a, if we look at this in wave function land, so suppose that this was two particles moving on a line, okay? So the wave function for this thing is given by this, where these are the position eigenvectors of uh, particle A and particle B, okay? 
if the state was a product state like this, this is the wave function, right? The wave function in this case is just the product of wave function A and wave function B. And that means the joint probability distribution factorizes. I'll call it the probability A of a function of random variables and the probability distribution B, which is the square of each of these guys. Okay? Yeah? What if you wanted to say keep track of a particle's position and like spin, it goes spin one half or... Sure, that's fine too. So at, for every degree of freedom, if I have, you know, I, I can have as many degrees of freedom as I like. And then I have a tensor product, and we're going to talk about this more. We're going to get back to spin. We haven't forgotten it. We just put it on hiatus. So every degree of freedom uh, is in a tensor product. Okay. So for example, if I had a part, if I wanted to say I have one particle, I want to keep track of its position and its spin, then the joint Hilbert space of the system is L2 if it's moving, say, on a line, tensor two-dimensional complex numbers. That is the Hilbert space associated with particle having a certain position and a certain spin. That's how we would formally write it. And we'll talk about that. They're called spinners. Yeah? Uh, so the the parts when we have, you know, psi AB is equal to psi of... If oh, that's true, yeah. If it's a product state, yeah. Oh, if it's a product state. Okay, so that's not spanning a new space. It is not. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's one member of that new space. Correct. Correct. Indeed. And in fact, this is the definition of a tensor product space. A tensor product space is the linear span of all product states. And there are states in the tensor product space which are not product states. Okay, for example, I mean, I can write one down in terms of wave functions. Uh, let's say, just as an example, let's say I have two particles in a harmonic well. It doesn't have to be in a harmonic well, because I can use the harmonic opposite of the wave functions that you know, I like. I call them particle one and particle two. The joint wave function might be this. Uh, alpha u0 x1 u1 x2 plus beta u0 uh, or u1 x1 u0 x2. What is this? Well, this is the particle where one of them is in the ground state and the other is in the excited state. But I don't know which, it, which one it is. So there's some probability amplitude alpha that particle one is in the ground state and particle two is in the first excited state. And there's some probability amplitude here that particle one is in the first excited state and particle two is in the ground state. This is not a product state. There's no way, there is no way to write this as some psi x1, psi x2, or phi x2. This is not a product state. But it is in the tensor product space because it is spanned by product states. In the same way that I could say, you know, a particle or a vector in three-dimensional space is the span of vectors along x, y, and z. But not every vector is along x, y, or z. It's the span. Okay? This kind of state is not a product state. It's not separable. It has another special name called an entangled state. Now, everyone loves to talk about entanglement. It sounds like the coolest thing since puffed wheat. I don't know why puffed wheat is cool, but that's... Uh, what people say. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of our semester. Okay. Okay. <coughs> um, so, right, continuing on. Um, so, formally speaking, as I said, 
the tensor product space is the span of all product states. And that is the space that describes the composite Hilbert space for multiple degrees of freedom. Okay? Um, and a, we can always write a basis for the tensor product space um, as uh, looking at the individual bases for, uh, say, in this case, if this were just two degrees of freedom, if I have a basis for Hilbert space A, which has some vectors, and a uh, basis for Hilbert space B, which has some vectors, then a basis for the tensor product space, there exists always a product basis. Again, not every basis need be a product basis, but I can always find a product basis by this construction. Okay? Question, what if, if the dimension of Hilbert space a is d sub a, and the dimension of Hilbert space B is d sub b, what is the dimension of the joint Hilbert space? d sub a times d sub b. Okay, so the dimension of the joint Hilbert space is just in the product of the dimensions. Right? That's a big deal. Because that means dimension is growing if I have multiple degrees of freedom exponentially. If I have n degrees of freedom, and each one of those degrees of freedom was associated with the Hilbert space of dimension d, what is the joint dimension of n in such things? d to the n. Okay. Was it going to work if you have one dimension? <coughs> what do you mean? If the dimensions of all of the space states are just one, you understand it with one dimension left over. It's true, but I think you have to be careful about what you're thinking about here. This is the dimension of Hilbert space. It's not the dimension of physical space along which the particle is moving. If a particle is moving along a line, what is the dimension of Hilbert space that describes all states of motion of the particle. Is it continuous? It's infinite. Okay. It's infinite. Okay? So if you deal with wave functions, you never see this exponentiation of the dimension because it started infinity and the dimension is always just infinite. It keeps infinity times infinity times infinity. It's only when you deal with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces that you ever see the exponentiation of the dimension of Hilbert space. Okay. Right, cool. All right, continuing then. So another piece of the formula we talked about is, of course, we talked about the tensor product of observables or operators. So I can define, if I have an observable, that if I said, oh, this observable OA acts on Hilbert space A, map vectors in this to vectors in that, and we have some other observable that acts on Hilbert space B, then I can, def there, I can define an observable that acts on the composite Hilbert space, Map vectors on vectors as the following that this acting on a product state is equal to the tensor product. of the individual actions. Okay? 
That's by definition. Now, what would you do if this tensor product acted on some general state? And you don't know whether it's maybe it's not a product state. Well, it can always decompose it in a basis of product states. Okay? So I can in, in, insert in here a resolution of the identity. Now, the resolution of the identity is, I'm going to write this, as I said, we have lots of different notations. And sometimes when I write something like this, This is a shorthand for E I F J outer product with E I tensor F J. Okay. Or I could think about this as the operator, the projector A tensor that. That's also equivalent. Okay, because this is an operator that acts on Hilbert space A, and this is an operator that acts on Hilbert space B. That's perfectly, they're all the same, they're just written to a different place. So this would equal O A tensor O B acting on, I'll call it alpha I J E I tensor Fj, where alpha Ij is a probability amplitude associated with that projection. Okay? And then I know how to act this. It's a linear operator, so it comes inside the sum. This guy acts on this basis vector. And this guy acts on this basis vector. Uh, A, sorry, thank you. All right. Very good. Um, now, I want to talk about eigenvectors operators. Suppose I had a particular operator on a joint space which was of the following form. It was some operator A and it did nothing to B. Or it's kind of some like this. Okay. So A acts on Hilbert space A and B acts on Hilbert space B. It's a sum of two operators that act on, on this. Okay. What is an example of an eigenvector of this operator? Exactly. So if there are, let's suppose A has eigenvectors little a, and B has eigenvectors little k b, with no that, then A B, which is A tensor B, is written, right, is an eigenvector. with eigenvalue A plus B. Okay? So this gets confusing. And uh, this is sometimes, uh, let me come back to that and use a certain language here that I often confuse it, so that uh, I'll come back to it. All right. So this tells us something about if we're looking, in particular if we're looking at Let's go back to the time-independent Schroeder equation. Okay. 
So we see the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. So now there are a special class of cases where the Hamiltonian is of this form. Okay? So suppose we see this H is the Hamiltonian. T 
plus
this, if it didn't have this form. And I started in a product state, and I did the time evolution, then it's not going to stay in a product state. In that case, we call the unitary entanglement. It's an entangling unitary because it creates entanglement. It creates correlation, quantum correlation. Yeah. Would that be like two spin one half particles? It would. I mean, if, if I mean, it depends on the interaction between the physical interaction. So there's physics here. There's you know, E and M and all that stuff. Quantum mechanics is not devoid of physics. All right. So, uh, right. Okay, so now let's come to the kind of, of uh, analysis here, looking at specific case. Let's consider uh, Let's suppose I have a free particle. Okay. What's the Hamiltonian? P equals P squared plus 2n. P squared over 2n. Say this is in 3D. 3D is a freedom. Okay. Is this separable? Yeah, it's separable in Px, Py, and Pz. We have to say separable with respect to what degrees of freedom. Okay. This is something that is almost always forgotten. That what whether a state is separable or not depends on what tensor product structure we are imposing. Let's say which degrees of freedom are we choosing to analyze the system with respect to. Yeah? What if you use P sub R, P sub beta? And P That's the next step, so we'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. He brings my next step. But yeah, let this look at at the moment. So this. Of course, what this really means is P sub x tensor the identity on y tensor the identity on z, and this is the ten, you know, x tensor the identity on z, and this is and uh, blah 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 blah. Well, why is the order for? I mean, I guess I don't understand these test products. I mean, I guess they're, they're, they're you have to decide if you're writing the state right. I, I, I'm saying that there, you know, when I write this tensor this tensor this tensor this, I have to talk about which. Hilbert space I'm talking about. So this is Hilbert space A or X, Hilbert space Y, Hilbert space Z. You just have to keep track of it. And then that's different if I win Hilbert space Z, uh, tensor Hilbert space A. They're, they're isomorphic Hilbert spaces, uh -huh. but in like the same way when you write down a column vector and you write down the components, okay. you just have to know what you agree on the order. I could order them any way I like, right? Okay. But once I write the order, I've got to keep saying that that's the order. Okay. It's just, it's just a bookkeeping. We would never do that, okay? <laughs> but I'm just emphasizing that fact, just to say that this, in fact, is of the form I wrote. And this is separable, so there's a Hamiltonian that acts on the x degree of freedom, there's a Hamiltonian that acts on the y degree of freedom, and there's a Hamiltonian that acts on the z degree of freedom. Okay. And the joint eigenstates of the system are just the product of the eigenstates associated with those degrees of freedom. So I can write an energy eigenstate uh, as Px tensor Py tensor Pz. Okay. And the energy eigenvalue associated with these three uh, eigenvalues is the sum of the 
eigenvalues associated with each degree of freedom. This is we said. I mean, this is I'm doing this in you know excruciating formalism. You sort of know this. We've done this a million times. I'm just showing you how it all fits together. Of course, that's just you know the map p squared over two n, where this is. And what is the eigen vector in position space? It's a, it's a, this is a momentum, I would say. E to the i, p. They're plane waves, right? But momentum eigenfunctions are plane waves, right? X, p, x is with our usual norm, delta normalization, e to the i, x, p, x over a function. Right? And so the three-dimensional wave function associated with the, this x, y, z is x tensor y tensor z dx dy dz x dx y dy Z, Z. Notice, just as a, once you take the inner product, this is just normal multiplication, multiplication by complex numbers. And this is e to the i over h bar, pxx plus pyy plus pzz over 2 pi h bar to the 3 halves, or e to the i over h bar. So the wave function is a product state, one for each degree of freedom, because the Hamiltonian is separate. All right. Now. Uh, Let's get to, as he suggested, we have different ways of assigning degrees of freedom to the system. Okay. Um, right. I can talk about r theta and phi. Those are uh, three, three. Freedom. And then I could write, uh, I could try to say that the joint Hilbert space of the system is instead of having a Hilbert space in x degree of freedom y, a, and z, I could in principle do this. Separated that out, 
These kinds of eigenvectors are called partial waves, as opposed to the plane waves, the spherical waves. Mm -hmm. I just want to focus on yeah. so, so separation doesn't necessarily mean that it's not dependent. I mean, you can That's right. Okay. 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 Um, right. So, let's look at some example now with respect to the, uh, some potentials. So, because the system is always separable in the kinetic energy, for a particle moving in some number of spatial dimensions, or some number of particles moving in some number of spatial dimensions. Whether or not the Hamiltonian is separable depends on the potential. Because we can always separate the kinetic energy. We can do it in cylindrical coordinates. We can do it in uh, spherical coordinates. We can do it in Cartesian coordinates. But the question is about the potential. Okay? So if we when we have a Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2m plus the potential of the function position, then separability depends on the potential. Okay. All right, so um, let's consider, for example, a particle in a box. This is a separable potential. Okay. Uh, what if I had a finite potential well? Suppose that this were true. Suppose I had something like that. Okay. Where everywhere outside here, the height is V0. Is this separable? I mean, what if I wrote this? Is that the product? Is this plus this that potential? No, it's not, right? That's the one that would be, you know, it would be V0 
v0, v0 to v0. To v0, I think, right? I think that's right. Right? So that's not, this potential is not the one I wanted. The one where it's v0 everywhere is not separable. Okay? This is not separable. Now, let's go back to the infinite case. What are the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian? <laughs> exactly. Right? So, you know, for each one of these guys, so we have now my energy eigenfunctions. associated with each of those. So the energy E and X, E and Y, H bar squared over 2M, K X of NX squared, plus boundary conditions for the i coordinate uh, is equal to uh, n i over l. Okay, that's how it meets the boundary conditions as we know. So this energy is h bar squared over 2m pi squared, I'm going to factor out an lx squared, and x squared plus ny squared, lx over ly squared. Okay? All right. So, now, one thing we see here is that whether or not there are degeneracies in the system, that is to say, if there are two different 
eigenfunctions that have the same eigenvalue depends on something about the ratio of these guys. So for example, if the ratio of Lx and Ly is rational, then we have degeneracies. Okay? So for example, suppose that Lx is twice Ly. Let's just suppose that were the case. I have that kind of effect. Right? Then um, E one uh, one here, right, is the same thing as what? This is 2 squared, right? So if this is 1 and this is 2, that's the same thing if this is 1, right? Right? That's a, those two are the same. They're both equal to 5 times that mass, h bar squared over 2 and pi squared over ln squared. Here. Maybe the other way around. Maybe 
this is five. So then this is equal to five. And then n equals two, and x equals two, and y equals one.
extends x into y and y into x and px into py and py into px. Then the Hamiltonian is unchanged. Because the potential is reflection symmetric. So if I have a reflection symmetric potential, then the Hamiltonian is invariant under the reflection symmetry operation. Which means another way of saying that is the Hamiltonian commutes with reflection. Which means that the eigenfunction, there exists eigenfunction, simultaneous eigenfunctions of the reflection operator and the Hamiltonian. So, um, if nx and y is an eigenfunction, or I'll just put it this way. with the same eigenvalue. They are degenerate. You see that because, so now I'm just going to simplify notation even further. I'll just specify them by their uh, eigenvalues. This on the, Ham the Hamiltonian acting on this with some energy. What is
Hamiltonian acting on the reflected K. Same energy, but the... Right, it's exactly the same energy, because these commute. Because they commute, I can move the Hamiltonian to the other side. This then is the same energy eigenvalue. So, this is an important lesson. The point is that if we have a symmetry, in this case we have reflection symmetry. If there is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, then there will be degeneracies. Symmetry and degeneracy are interrelated to one another. Because there is a symmetry operator that this commutes with, there are a set of different eigenvectors which share the same energy eigenvalue. Okay, that's sometimes in, instead of called a accidental degeneracy, this kind of degeneracy is called an essential degeneracy. Let's do another example before our time is up here. Let's talk about a particle in a simple harmonic oscillator well in 2D. Okay? Yeah? Do you mean that it has a 1 half kx squared and a 1 half ky squared for the potential? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. So let me let me explain that. Okay. So for example, here's here here's a uh, simple, which is a classical picture. Let's say I have two kinds of springs. I have a particle that's attached by springs. Okay, to a wall. And there's a spring constant kappa x, and there's a spring constant kappa y. Okay. So I can pull it in either direction. And there's a, uh, a resonance frequency associated with that spring constant, and a resonance frequency associated with that spring constant. Okay. What is the Hamiltonian for this? eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the system. H bar omega x. So the energy H bar omega H bar omega x times n plus a half yeah. plus H bar omega y times n y times plus a half. Yep. So there are two quantum numbers. accidental degeneracies in this system, but there's a special case that I just want to conclude with. The isotropic simple harmonic oscillator, say in 2D. Let's say that the two frequencies were the same. The springs were the same. So it doesn't matter how I pull it, it has a restoring force in that case, which is just proportional to the distance from the origin. It doesn't depend whether I'm pulling it along x or I'm pulling it on y. It just says as long as if I pull it some distance r from the origin, 
it feels the same force. It's isotropic. Okay? In that case, we have something special. Well, first of all, the energy in that case, let's call that omega. Is that right? And we see this guy has degeneracy, right? So I have I have energies when let's let's just make a little table here and x and n y. So n x is zero and n y is zero. Uh, the energy is, uh, uh, I'll just call it one, okay, in units of h bar omega. When this is zero, uh, when th this is equal to two, et cetera, three, blah, blah, blah. When this is one and that's zero, get two, three, blah, blah, blah. Now, when this is one and this is one, then I have three, four, etc. When this is one and this is three, and four. I'm sorry, four, five, etc. So we see degeneracies here. There are many different combinations of nx and ny, which uh, in fact, we could write this, I mean, they're always integers, so the energy here is h bar omega times some n plus 1, where n can be 0, 1, 2, 3, but there's a degeneracy. Okay? And what is that degeneracy? n plus 1. So there's a degeneracy in this system, which means that there's really another quantum number m, but this guy is completely independent of that quantum number. It only depends on n, not m. What kind of degeneracy is this? Is this an essential degeneracy or an accidental degeneracy? It's essential. It's associated with what kind of symmetry? It's true, it has reflection symmetry, but in fact, this guy has even more symmetry than that. Let's look at the Hamiltonian again. It's p squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega squared x squared plus y squared. This is my cylindrical coordinate row. This is P rho squared plus P phi squared equals 2 n. Right? What kind of symmetry does this have? Remember, this is just the rate, this is just x squared plus y squared. It's rotational symmetry. The potential is independent. It's active. The potential here is independent of phi. It's azimuthally symmetric. It's rotationally symmetric. This has rotation symmetry. It doesn't matter where, how much I pull it from the origin at what angle, it sees the same force. Okay? So this has rotational symmetry. There's a rotation operator as a function of phi, and my Hamiltonian is invariant. 
with respect to rotations around the z-axis. We see that classically because the potential is independent of phi, the conjugate momentum is conserved. Right? Remember that from Lagrangian mechanics. So there, the, there's a conserved quantity. What is that conserved quantity? It's this, which is, of course, angular momentum around the z-axis. The angular momentum around the z-axis is conserved because we have no torques, because the potential is independent of phi, which means that there is a symmetry. Conserved quantities and symmetries are one and the same. And the quantum mechanics are also related to degeneracies. We will pick all that up and talk about angular momentum for many weeks to come.